good, uh, good afternoon. It's October 13th, 2022, and um, Cumberland County Board of Commissioners, our regular agenda session. Uh, we're going to uh, call it the orders, one o'clock. Uh, we're going to have the invocation uh, by Commissioner Evans um, and the pledge. Uh, yes, we the Lord and the Father, once again, want to say thank you. Thank you for allowing us to assemble here today to do the will of the people of God. Please keep us on one accord and focus on what we need to do to make this county better for each and every one. Bless each and every family that is represented here today. And Lord, again, we do thank you for being God. In Jesus Christ, our Lord, we pray. Amen. Amen. I pledge allegiance. Take us to the approval of the agenda. If I can get a motion to approve the um, anything, Madam Manager, uh, got a motion to approve it. A second? second, all those in favor, that's unanimous. Uh, that takes us to presentation. Our first one is with Alliance Health Update, Madam Manager. And we will thank Rob and Sean for coming down and they introduce uh, uh, everyone else. Yes, sir. It's been a, a little bit of time since we've had the Alliance before us, so we're pleased to have them today to give us an update on ongoing initiatives. Welcome Thank you. Sean. Good afternoon, Mr. Chair, Commissioners, Manager Ken. It's good to be with you. As, as Manager Ken said, it's been, a, it's been a little bit since we've been here. Again, I'm Rob Robinson. I am the CEO with Alliance Health. Uh, I have Sean Schreiber here, who is our Chief Operating Officer. And then in the audience is Carlotta Ray and Brianna Perkins, who are at our local site. Uh, they work in our care management partner. And if I can introduce uh, Vicki Evans, who is one of your board members uh, that's sitting over there. So you know who your boss is in the room. I know, so right? My just make sure. coming up. And All right. right. <laughs> this is my boss. Hi, Vicki. Always a pleasure. All right. Um, so we're going to talk about a couple things. One, just a quick overview of who Alliance is. And I want to talk about Medicaid transformation. Um, and then get into some of the challenges we're having and some of the solutions that we're working on. And Sean's going to Sean's going to do that for me. So um, first is um, let me talk about who we are. So we are an LME MCO. We are one of six LME MCOs across the state. LME stands for Local Management Entity, and that's about managing care for people who are uninsured or underinsured. MCO is, uh, stands for Managed Care Organization, and that's about managing services for people with uh, Medicaid. Um, we, are, uh, we are not a service provider. We are the manager of the system. Um, we contract with providers who deliver care. Um, providers range anything from uh, therapists all the way up uh, to hospitals. We contract with 42 hospitals across the state. They actually deliver care. Our responsibility is to help manage them, pay those providers, contract with them, monitor, um, and make sure people are receiving the services um, that they need. Um, we serve, we're six counties. And last time I was here, I think we were four. We have added Mecklenburg and Orange. So our counties are Cumberland, Durham, Johnston, Wake, Mecklenburg, and Orange counties. Uh, on the map here, you'll see us. We are in the purplish color. Um, um, you can see we have the fewest number of counties, but we are by far uh, the largest in the state by population, right? We're the ones um, called on to help manage in um, urban settings. Next slide. So I get a lot of questions about how to access services. Um, I always want to share this slide. It's real easy to contact us, right? We operate a 24-7 call center. You will get a live person each and every time you call. Um, again, that is 24-7. Uh, the folks that answer the phone uh, will help screen, triage, uh, and refer to a provider if, if uh, necessary. We also do crisis response. So if someone calls and they're in crisis, uh, we do have licensed staff on board. 
who will help de-escalate the situation. If they cannot do that, then they would um, either uh, deploy crisis services like Global Crisis or direct them to where they need to go. And of course, in worst case scenario, they would help uh, call 911 and, and get them the assistance that they need. All right, so I want to talk about um, Medicaid transformation. I'm going to try and keep this as simple as possible. It's, it's a little bit complicated. Um, so the state's in the midst of um, implementing Medicaid transformation. Um, this is really about bringing managed care to Medicaid. Uh, there are two parts to the Medicaid transformation plan. First part is the standard plan. Uh, so there are five in Cumberland, there are, there are four statewide, and then the fifth one is regional, which happens to cover Fayetteville. Those are your large commercial managed care companies, United Healthcare, Blue Cross Blue Shield, Mayor Health, Caritas, uh, Complete Care, and I'm always missing one, but there are five here in this area. Um, your citizens eligible um, with Medicaid can choose which plan they want to work with. The second part of Medicaid transformation, the one we're most interested in, is Taylor plans, because that's what we're going to become is a Taylor plan. Both plans are responsible for behavioral health, um, pharmacy services, uh, as well as management of physical health services, right? The difference between the two, standard plans are responsible for people with behavioral health with mild to moderate mental health issues. And I define mild to moderate is, is either they're not receiving services or they're only receiving basic outpatient. Taylor plan, we are responsible for people with severe mental health, severe substance use, and just about everybody with intellectual and developmental um, disability, right? So for us across, and I'll get into numbers, but for us across our six county region equals about 50,000 people. So it's a little bit complicated. Um, the system used to be set up where we were responsible for all behavioral health care, not anymore. If you're mild to moderate, right, if you're not receiving services, you, you will be in a standard plan. It's, it's a standard plan job to get anybody need, that needs services, connected services. If they need higher level care that we offer, then they will be transitioned to us. We have a more robust um, service package than, with it, with it, than the standard plans do, and so, we're able to um, hopefully effectively treat those folks. Oops. All right, so there is, uh, I'll, I'll make this quick, but I do think you need to be aware. So uh, we were scheduled to go out and go live as a Taylor plan December 1st. Again, the standard plans, the five standard plans went live over a year ago. Taylor plans, we were scheduled to go live December 1st. We're now going to be going live April 1st. Um, of this year. It's fine. We were ready to go live on December uh, 1st. Um, but given that, you know, the, the people, the citizens have been through so much over the past year with the launch of standard plan, you got COVID, there were county realignments, uh, we supported the state's decision to move it out to April 1st. Care management services um, will continue to go live December 1st. Again, if you have questions about that, but we will be offering um, and, and targeted care management for people uh, that are eligible for the Taylor plan on December 1st. All right, so our populations that Alliance will be responsible for are um, the Taylor plan population. Again, that's about 50,000 people. I want to get some numbers here for you. Um, so for us, again, it's about 50,000 people um, across our sixth county in Cumberland, about 9,000 people with Medicaid. And, um, residing in Cumberland will be eligible for the Taylor plan. We will continue to be responsible for people who are uninsured. Across our six counties, there's about 330,000 people eligible uh, for state and county funded. In Cumberland, there's about 34,000 people who are uninsured, underinsured. And then the last population is Medicaid Direct. Again, this gets a little complicated, so I'll make it brief. Um, Medicaid Direct is for people who are delayed or excluded from going into managed care. So we will continue, we will manage their behavioral health and IDD services. Physical health will be done fee for service just as it is done now. And that, that equals about 54,000 people across um, Alliance Catchment Area and about 10,500 people here in Cumberland. All right, our funding, we are very grateful for your $4.8 million for services. Uh, working with you and working with the county manager's office, uh, we have dedicated all that money to the 
Cumberland uh, Recovery Response Center, which is our crisis facility, formerly known as um, uh, Roxy. Uh, there is a little bit of admin support that's come out of that 4.8. And we'll get in a little bit further about Roxy and where we are with that facility. Sean's going to do that for me. All right, capacity challenges. So I, I do, um, while there are have been some improvements, service expansion that Sean's going to talk about, there are still continuing to be some capacity challenges, um, particularly for child residential, um, particularly for kids involved in social services, right? We serve thousands of kids in foster care every day. We do struggle uh, with child residential services. There, it is strictly a capacity issue. Um, we've lost over 112 beds, which may not sound like a lot, but when you're in a catchment, when I'm here, when we serve a catchment area that's uh, growing quickly, 112 beds is a lot. We should be talking about um, expanding that. So it's typically for kids with severe and complex needs, right? These are the kids that have the greatest needs that there's not bed availability. We struggle with bed availability. We eventually get there, but that's a problem. Jim, so, so is that 112 beds across the state? Yes. So for every LME, I mean, everybody's trying to get these same beds. Correct. And so even with our catchment area where we have as many people or more than right. some of the other areas, um, and even as we do this, uh, I think it's important for the commissioners to know, we're actually a little bit better than some of the other ones. Like Wake County had to turn a whole floor uh, into uh, to taking care of these kids. They, they basically turned it into a uh, place for them to be able to stay. Uh, we're not quite that bad in Cumberland County yet, but uh, uh, direct, I mean, uh, Assistant Manager Steens can probably, uh, she's smiling over there. She used to be the DSS uh, director. Um, but every 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 county is uh, having this with the PTRF. They all, it's a statewide issue. It's not just necessarily. I, what I'm trying to get to is not a Cumberland County issue. It's this is not a statewide a county. issue. It's a statewide issue. I'll talk a little bit more about uh, why that is. And just if you think about it, one provider we talked to a couple weeks ago had 70 people and kids on the wait list, right? So are they going to take these severe, complex kids with multiple issues, multiple um, displacements, or are they going to take somebody they can easily manage? So the kids, unfortunately, with the greatest need are, are sometimes left behind. So are we sending them out of state? Which we, is do send, we do send some kids out of state. Which then, uh, in terms of the cost, is that done? So if it's a Cumberland County kid that goes out of our county, um, does that come back to us in terms of having to pay some of that cost, or how is that distributed? I guess from to everybody across the, right. the state and for counties, because that is an extremely expensive proposition. Uh, I'll give my answer, Sean, if you want to expand. So the, the short answer is uh, the payment is not always higher. I mean, it, it, it's in range. The bigger issue is family reunification, right? We, uh, we, we expect treatment that families are part of that treatment. But when you send a kid to Alabama, it's it's hard to get families there to spend time working with them. That's probably the bigger issue. And that's the cost, though. But I mean, it's a cost. It's, 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 it's going to be a cost because you either got to transport the family or transport the the kid back and forth. I mean, it's, and, and, and not being able to reunify. Absolutely. Is, uh, the Absolutely. Thing, which means they stay in foster care that much longer. Absolutely. It's, it's it's our top priority as an agency is figuring this out. And again, Sean and his team have done a remarkable job. We have things coming, but we're not there yet. we we got to get there sooner. Quick question. Yes, sir. How long have you been figuring it out? <laughs> figuring child residential? Yes. Well, the issue has been exacerbated by COVID, right? So there's been staffing and workforce issues, and people have decided to close their facility during that COVID, and they haven't opened it up. So when I say 112 beds have been closed, that's been over the last couple of, couple of years. Thank you. Um, Provider-specific capacity issues. Sometimes we get asked, do we have wait lists? On Innovations Program, that's a program for people with IDD. Yes, there's a wait list. Um, I'd be happy to talk about that. But in terms of accessing services, the answer is kind of sort of, right? We have capacity within the network. If someone calls us and needs services, we can get them something. The issue is they may be asking for something that's not readily available, whether a provider's having, you know, just laid off a psychiatrist or they had a staffing shortage or they just got 10 new people today. While they may not be able to go to their provider of choice, we should always have something available that we would give someone. And we've worked really hard to make sure that we don't say, I'm sorry, you 
got a substance use or behavioral health issue and you go on a wait list and hopefully we'll be able to maintain that. Uh, direct care workforce issues, I will tell you right now, this is probably the biggest challenge that we have um, statewide is the workforce, particularly uh, for frontline staff working in uh, residential treatment, uh, personal care services, those kinds of things. Um, uh, there's just a shortage. People have gotten out of the business. The pay has not been good. There hasn't been rate increases. This was brought up at the General Assembly yesterday or Tuesday. They spent couple hours talking about solutions to this. The state did allocate last session uh, some one-time money to pay these folks bonuses. Um, that's kind of stabilized things a little bit, but it's not a long-term solution. We've also made the effort to increase rates and the increase rates to providers. We expect that money to go to um, go to the workforce, um, helping sustain, sustain that. Behavioral health in, 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 in a minute. And then the last one, there's still no Medicaid expansion within North Carolina. I know the General Assembly is getting close on that, but that's a huge issue. Our biggest challenge is the disparity between what is available for you if you're uninsured, underinsured, compared to what's available to you if you have Medicaid. Medicaid, we can do some things. Uninsured, it's do the best that you can. When I say uninsured, I mean people that are homelessness, on the verge of homelessness, people that don't have insurance or means to pay for the services. We get state dollars and we get county dollars. Um, mostly the state dollars to serve it is just woefully in, inadequate um, to serve this population. Medicaid expansion won't completely solve it, but man, it'll help tremendously um, if we can make that happen. All right, I'm gonna turn it over to Mr. Schreiber. And then um, after he's done talking about what we're doing to expand, I'd be happy to answer your questions. Thank you, Rob. Good afternoon. I'm Sean Schreiber, Chief Operating Officer of Alliance. So I'm going to run through a couple of things we've done specifically for Cumberland. Some of these uh, programs are meant to address crisis, and some are just routine service. So one of the early challenges we've, not early, but one of the challenges we've we encountered over probably the last two years was this issue that Rob talked about, that there's kids who are giving place to uh, Department of Social Service custody, who needs services right away. The behavioral health system has always been set up that if you're in a psychiatric emergency, there's some services, but if you have urgent needs, typically it's you know not overnight. But you now have kids showing up in DSS buildings, in group homes who needed an overnight service and needed some more support. So we put a plan in place to begin building some of these things out. One of the first things we did is we looked at what could be a service that might help stabilize families and including kids who are in the Department of Social Services foster home, child's beginning to act out, the foster parents thinking they may not be managed that kid very well anymore. So we looked at a different service because we didn't really have anything, North Carolina didn't have anything in the continuum that would meet those needs. We found the services out of uh, North, I think out of New Jersey, called Mobile Outreach Crisis uh, or Response Engagement Stabilization, or MORS. And the idea, this is a mobile crisis stabilization program for of mobile crisis, one of the big challenges with it has a two-hour response time. So if someone calls, it takes responder two hours. Most of us, if we can wait two hours, don't have a crisis. So this is a little better. It's a guaranteed 45-minute response time to a family having a crisis with a child. And they go, they stabilize, they can stay for hours. If the child can't be safe, they can help get the appropriate crisis service. But more importantly, they actually stay involved with this family for about 45 more days to really make sure things have settled and to make sure that individuals are better linked with services. So we're excited. We actually got to pilot this first in Cumberland County. So a group called Communicare started doing that uh, back uh, this July. To date, they served about 141 families in this service. So kids who've either been referred from Department of Social Services or kids that were identified uh, juvenile justice system at risk for out of home placement. And so Communicare has been doing that service. Yeah. So, so let me ask you a question. So I understand Communicare is doing that and you get the, those referrals, but I'm a parent with a child in crisis. How do I know that that even exists? So you would call our 800 number that Rob said, hopefully. And I think this is a challenge that we want to continue to work on. How do we get that number? Out? That's right. Because occasionally we'll get these um, complaints, as Rob said, that, hey, there's no services, we don't know how to get services. So we go look at our telephone system and can see, well, we only had like 500 calls from the community or from an area. Mm -hmm. And that lets us know we need to do a little bit more publicity and, and advertising of this. So part of it is if you call our 800 number, they would, and you call and your family said they're for Cumberland County having a crisis, 
they should mobilize that team and send them out to your home. So I guess I would go to Mr. Haney as to whether either with us, the city, or anybody that has a website, whether you can have one that talks about mental health that puts that number that if they go to the website and look at mental health because people are trying to find it, that that number pops up that they know to call that possibility. And, and, you know, I would think every municipality that we got in Cumberland County, uh, if the more that that number is out, the better it is for people to know the call. And I think a lot of folks, they always knew that they could just go up to the mental health center up on uh, Bradford Avenue, and now they don't have that. And they're like, what do I do? So the more we get that number out, I think the better. So. And, you know, Mr. Chair, and, and thank you. I'm sorry to raise my hand. But, uh, you're absolutely right. The more the number out and the more accessible it is, you probably will get. I know you get more calls. Um, the website is great. It's very great. But I always have a problem with just putting things on the website. There's got to be other avenues that are taken to make sure that our, our constituents get the information that they need for the services that they need. <laughs> that's tell you about them. Yeah, that's our local people that we have on well, executively. Okay. I just put it up there. Well, that's, the that's all well and good, <laughs> but I'm still making it point. <laughs> you know, it, it, it's, it's got, that has to be done. There are people that I'm sure that, uh, as I stated, that need the services, and we need to get them around in every avenue that we possibly can. Yeah, Commissioner Evans, if I can just respond, you're exactly right. The website is one thing. Not a lot of people know about our website. They don't know how to access services. They don't know how to do our website. We, we do a ton on social media. We do radio local here. We've done billboards in the past. I just asked our communications department to put together a marketing educational plan here uh, in Cumberland. So that's going to be rolling out soon with different ways. Exactly right. We can't just do it one way. It doesn't settle. And the team back there, they work hard. We do community events all over the place. We also offer mental health one-on-one -on -one training for anybody that asks, whether you're a private business, a government entity, we will come in, talk about signs and symptoms of mental health, and then talk about how to access services. If you know anyone that's interested in that, we don't charge for that. That is something we do on behalf of the community. So there's a bunch of different ways to get the word out. And thank you for saying that. I can't wait till we get to Roxy and talk about substance abuse. <laughs> because um, that's that's another area that needs to be exposed more. And getting out to the community, you say you go to a number of events, that's all well and good too. But also in the communities that are pressed in need of these services, are those communities being touched? It's good to show up at the fair, it's good to do this, it's good to show up at, at a chamber or whatever else you may show up at. But inside these communities where these people are suffering from the lack of having health care or, or getting um, the attention that they need for substance abuse, as yeah. I has stated, um, we need to reach those communities. Yeah. And Commissioner Evans, thank you for bringing that up. So we do have a slide on some of our outreach efforts on what we're doing, where we're going. If, if, we're, if we're missing a mark or there's something missing in there, we'd love to get your feedback on, on where else we should go. Yes, sir. All right, so I keep going. So one of the other things we looked at, it, it relates both to access to care, excuse me, and to uh, crisis services as we form something called One Care Cumberland. It's an aftercare network. A big challenge we've had, not just in Cumberland County, in most places, is people get into crisis services, they go to behavioral inpatient care, they get stabilized, they go back to the community, they never connect with the community provider, and then usually 30, 60, 90 days, they're right back in the emergency department or back in a crisis facility having some kind of issue. And so to make it easier for people to navigate and connect, we started this one care. We, we hired a group to come in, get a, a small group of providers, get them electronically hooked up to Cape Fear Valley Hospital. Um, they're also hooked up to the crisis uh, facility, so when the beds are online, they'll be able to use this too. But the idea is that a social worker, all they have to do is go in one place, not call lots of different providers, put in some referral information, shoots out to a bunch of these providers who are contractually obligated to uh, respond within an hour or two and to see a person within four days. So the state standards, they want people to see within seven. So this group, we said we want you to give advanced access in four days to be able to have people follow up. And so it's having some impact. It started small. Now Cape Fear Valley sends most of the referrals through this so we can track where people went. The other nice thing about that is if someone doesn't show up for an appointment, 
the provider knows where they were sent, and they can do some outreach and follow-up, as opposed to if a social worker calls a bunch of places and someone takes it, no one really, you know, no one really knows how to follow up. So we're doing that. An example of how to start to work, rough about a year and a half ago, only about 20% of the people who were uninsured were showing up for their aftercare appointments. Again, and the reason this is important is because that's a high likelihood they're going to show back up in a crisis, use those services, use an inpatient bed. After about two, two quarters of having this in place, the, uh, the about 40% people followed up, and the last quarter they were about 58% of the people following up, which is actually higher than the, the national average for Medicaid and on par with what commercially insured individuals follow with care. So they've done a good job there. Again, I think it needs to expand further, but it's a good way of expanding access. Another part of this group is we start a service with them called Assertive Engagement. It gets a little bit to what um, Commissioner Evans was speaking to, that this is a group that um, instead of waiting for patients to come to their appointments, they go out into the community and find the members. So in the ideal world, if someone's over at uh, what used to be Roxy, or at uh, inpatient, if they get the referral before the person leaves, a member on the CISERV engagement team goes out, meets the individual there, helps them get set up in the community, helps them follow up with services, because it's always much better when you kind of meet somebody for the first time in treatment than when you have to go out into the community to find them. So the CISERV engagement has been helpful, and I think that's part of the reason we're seeing some better follow-up. Again, I think our goal now is that we know some of these things are working, get them to touch more people. Going back to one of the earlier challenges Rob talked about was residential capacity and then crisis capacity for kids. Uh, probably about two years ago, this, we began working really closely with the Department of Social Services and identified there's just this group of kids who we just didn't have the right services for. The traditional state group home system, not state, but all the group homes, therapeutic foster care from around the state, would typically not take these kids, so they would sit in DSS uh, group home without necessarily all the supports that were needed, or worst case, be sitting in an office someplace waiting for a placement. So we so the county was nice enough to basically uh, give Alliance a, a former county-run group home. We brought in an outside provider called Thompson. We've been working to get, thanks to the county funding, to get this uh, facility kind of changed into a therapeutic uh, treatment group home. So the idea if a child now shows up in social service custody, they need placements. If there's not an emergency placement available any place in the state, they can go to this home, be there for about 30 to 45 days. And the goal would be really could you then unify the child back home from here? If nothing else, it allows people time to think about what a good placement is. A lot of times with kids, if they're in an emergency department, they just get the first bed available in the state, which means it could be, you know, in Asheville. It could be in Greenville or worse, it could be out of state. So we're hoping this moves this the building has been renovated. It had its first licensure walkthrough uh, earlier in the month. There's a little more work to do. Apparently, the windows that they installed weren't big enough, so they have to put in bigger windows for licensure standards. And this should open, we're hoping, um, a little later in the fall. So a couple of other things we're doing, and this is getting to the issue of substance use disorders. A lot of this is going to, not necessarily, it's going to focus on um, opioid use. However, all these facilities are trained to engage and treat people for, you know, multiple and chronic polysubstance use disorders. So one of the things we did that we're really excited about, is we've actually, going back to some of our projects, we've done a lot of new things in Cumberland County that we're not doing in the rest of the Alliance region. So one of the things we're doing in Cumberland is we're, having, we're expanding to provide office-based outpatient opioid treatment for the uninsured. So this has always been a big gap in the system. A lot of people were uninsured, only had the choice to go to what we kind of typically know as a methadone clinic, which means you have to go every single morning, stand in line, get a dose of medication. It's very effective, but it's also not for everyone. But that's always been a historic option. So we contract with a provider called LifeNet, who's going to provide office-based treatment to individuals. So they can go in, they get assessed, they get started on medication, and they don't have to show up every day. There's some counseling that goes along with it. What may, what's a big deal about being for the uninsured is there's a medical component to opioid treatment that people need to have access to medications and they have to have access to labs. So Alliance typically hasn't been funded to, to do those kind of things. Well, we've been able to kind of take some of other kind of reinvestment dollars and be able to launch a service. So now provide will be able to do the opioid-based treatment. Individuals can get labs for free. And most importantly, they can get the medications for free they need um, to be safe. Yes, sir. Commissioner King. I don't know if you were in on my last meeting, but at the end of it, we talked about the opioid problem. Um, and I guess, you know, when you get to that point of post-opioid use, you know, there usually it's a difficult, right? For 
general knowledge, do you know what the percentage is of people who, who successfully matriculate back in and off opioids or fentanyl or, or whatever it is? You know, I, I don't. Um, what I do know is that, unfortunately, still some, uh, some under 20% of the population who even has a problem accesses care. And the evidence suggests that people who get involved with medication-based opioid treatment have better outcomes than people who necessarily who are involved in counseling. And actually, some, it's actually thought that if people get just the medication treatment alone, they actually have as good of outcomes as if it's matched with long-term therapy, which we know can be an access challenge. And this is why there's a big push to get it in places like jails and people coming out of emergency departments getting started medication. I don't have the statistics on um, efficacy. And also, I think you, with substance abuse, I think people are starting to look at it differently, that it's not kind of either you're better or you're not better. It's kind of a, a journey. And, you know, you might be doing well, have some setbacks, and, you know, get back on and into treatment. It seems to be a pattern of good, good times and then mm -hmm. getting back. Did, did I hear you say that your statistics show that only 20% of people that are considered maybe an addict mm -hmm. are, are seeking? Yeah, that's a, and that's a national statistic too. Yeah. Uh, we have a opioid problem. A couple of counties in North Carolina. Yeah, big one. And this is this is one of them. Yeah. Right? So, and again, I think the, the reason for highlighting this is an option for the uninsured that we haven't been able to offer anywhere. The other thing we yeah, have one more question. I'm sorry. Sorry. Yes, sorry. Mr. Evans has a question. Um, yes, Sean. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, and opioid problem is a terrible issue. Uh, matter of fact, substance abuse itself is terrible. Um, the treatments that, that you present regarding what you're doing for the opioid and whatnot, but I'm, I'm curious to know, you gave us a percentage of how many are using opioid here, or un, what was that percentage you did, sir? No, I said uh, what I did know is about 20% of the population who has substance use disorder issues in general get into treatment. So I, I don't know the, number, the specifics for this community. Okay. When, um, and I'm sure that includes crack cocaine and marijuana and alcohol and all that stuff. So as far as your treatment is concerned, and, and just as you say, it's an ongoing thing. <laughs> but what, what are you doing for the community to realize that you, if you do, address that issue uh, regarding other substances? Ones like I just named, yeah. crack cocaine, mm -hmm. cocaine, and alcohol, marijuana, all this. I have marijuana be marked off soon, <laughs> but um, those other issues. Well, I don't know. Uh, alcohol is kind of legal, and we see a lot of people struggling with that. So I don't know what will happen to marijuana being legal. But so one again, I think most of these substances, these providers are are expected to screen for other substance use disorders. So I mentioned paying for labs. That's a big deal because. I think you're right. Most people just don't use one thing anymore. We had a, a member of our team do a presentation to the board, and it's you see people, you know, while um, uh, opioid use is on the rise, cocaine use is also on the rise in certain communities, marijuana, excessive alcohol is still a problem in a lot of places. But one thing is they all have to screen for this, so they're required to screen for other drugs and alcohol use. And if there's certain, if there's, they notice that they're supposed to refer into other treatment if they can't provide it themselves. So this group can do a, a range of treatment. The opioid treatment programs typically have to refer into other levels of care, which we do have in the community with substance abuse outpatient intensive treatment. And um, once, uh, it always brings up, once the Cumberland County Response Center gets open, people can go there for detoxification as well. But the idea is these, some of these providers can do it directly and some can refer into a network. And we do have a network of providers who do substance use treatment in the community. Okay. Thank you very much. I apologize, but this is, this is something we should keep you talking about. Um, so tell me a little bit about, I, I'm, I'm not very aware of where the EMS overdose response team, is that going to be an actual location? Okay, or is yeah. it just going to be individuals who go out and when they suspect an assessment? So my understanding is this is actually fairly recently launched. So Cape Fear Valley. The, the Cape Fear Valley. So if there's an overdose, there's a social worker and a, a peer support uh, professional, someone who has kind of lived experience with their own substance abuse, has been in recovery for a while. So if there's an overdose, they actually go out, engage the person, engage the family, 
and make sure they get linked back to treatment. So that's a really big problem. But, but in a lot of communities, EMS will do a response, they'll give Narcan, save somebody's life, and then basically they're off site, and then the person's left to fend for themselves. So the idea of this program is people will go out um, either with or after an EMS call and make sure they're fine with these families or individual individuals and families and getting them into care. So, so Commissioner Keith, this is comes from Commissioner Stewart, um, and uh, Cape Fear Valley is this is one of the things that we we funded and the community paramedic, the community paramedic program. Um, we were in a great position, I think, when. Um, Cafe Valley hired their new director at EMS. He came from uh, Onslow County, who they already ran the program. And so it made it a little bit easier transition. Hopefully it's going to get bigger. But uh, Commissioner Stewart uh, brought it to the group when she was in Wilmington, and we were at the uh, County Commissioner Association. And we've, uh, it was really interesting. We've talked to the people in Buncombe County, Onslow County. And uh, I think as this grows, uh, I was really impressed, and I think she could speak for it, uh, with the Buncombe, uh, because they had a whole lot of peer support. It's, what they found out was as EMS goes out, does the Narcam, and the person gets back up, they're like, I'm not going to the hospital. See you later. And they're back out in the community. And then within 24 hours, the EMS is back out there again with the same person, hitting them with the Narcam. They're like, thank you. I'm, I'm good now. I'm going to go. And so with the peer support, supposedly, hopefully, to get them to those providers that uh, are in the community and, and help them out. So hats off to Commissioner Stewart uh, for bringing that to Cumberland County and for Alliance to help fund that. And Cape Fear Valley, which is uh, running the program. Yeah, collaboration works, I think. Yeah, they're doing the hard work. Yes, exactly. You know, it just as a side note, this is when we talk about like one of the other reasons Medicaid expansion is so important. In most states where they have Medicaid expansion, all this money you hear about coming in for opioid settlements, you know, all the pharmacy uh, distributor settlements, all those things, that money goes to creative programs like this. In North Carolina, we're having to use a lot of that just to pay for day-to-day -day treatment. You know, if Medicaid was there to cover the treatment, all those opioid funds are here, which really comes into millions and millions of dollars, tens of millions over the years, um, could be doing a lot more creative infrastructure, infrastructure building. Um, the other thing I just want to highlight on here is for opioid treatment programs. So now we contract with both of the uh, opioid treatment programs or methadone programs in Cumberland County, and it's for both the uninsured and the uh, individuals with Medicaid. Again, a higher number of people, some use disorders are not covered by Medicaid, so that's important. Since we started contracting with a second facility, that second facility saw about 250 people actively engaged in treatment, just a little bit under half are uninsured. So in any given any kind of given day in Cumberland County, it's about 800 or so individuals who are visiting a, a methadone clinic wow. to get treatment. There you go, Mr. Keith. Mm -hmm. All right. So these are some newer things that are that are just kind of at a kind of early launching stages. So one thing uh, is this community-based capacity restoration. Um, it sounds like it's a very fancy thing, but it, it's general for individuals who are found not competent to stand trial. They typically either wait, sometimes in a jail, and, and, and require a lot of behavioral support in jail. Sometimes they're in a hospital, or waiting to, to get treatment and get a thorough evaluation to see what it'll take to get them to be able to, you know, face face uh, trial for the crimes. Often these individuals are sent to the state hospital to get these things. At any given time, there's a big portion of state hospital that can't take in people in behavioral crisis because they're kind of in a holding pattern. So the idea is to move some of these services and evaluations and supports back into the community so someone can go into a local jail, do the assessment, provide some case management, care management so the person can be released, kind of freeing up room, maybe in the jail for somebody else, and not taking a hospital bed. Again, these are one of the things that we hope create some capacity. The other program that we had started um, in Mecklenburg and we're expanding to the rest of our counties is something called therapeutic support. And this is again for children who are in therapeutic, who are in, uh, excuse me, children who are in the custody of the Department of Social Services, so foster care kids. If a uh, social worker is doing a home visit and they sense that things are about to blow, and they can bring in this program and they can work intensively, like go in, work with kids, take them out of home for a couple of days of the week, work with the families and get them engaged. If unfortunately a child ends up in a non-therapeutic uh, placement, like even the, the local group home here, which has some supports, but maybe not all the supports of kids with challenging behaviors need. This provider will come on site to the group home, same thing, 
just take the kid out, get him away from everyone for a little bit, work on some social skills, and they can provide some support to staff. So I'm hoping to have this up and going in this area in the next, I'd say, two months. The manager, I think, and Sean and Eliza, is that we are doing a pilot program with some case managers um, to deal with some of those, trying to keep them in the home. So I think we need to put these two programs in touch with each other because I think it's if, if we can do both of that with the case managers that we have and the, and the therapeutic support that you all have, I think we can uh, can uh, kind of wrap our, our arms around that. So if we make a note of that, uh, I think that's those two programs together. Thank you. Yeah, and I would tie in the Moore's program to that as well. So crisis, then these people can come and do a little bit different more support. You don't get this to happen. So some other things that we're just kind of in early stages of looking to do in the community. I think there's a renewed interest in uh, medication-assisted treatment in jail. Um, so there's some, some attention being brought to that. We've, we've uh, partnered in Durham with uh, the sheriff, the county jail, and Durham's one of the first to offer uh, medication-assisted treatment for people while they're incarcerated so they can come out and you know not be at high risk for overdose. That's a huge overdose risk time for folks. So looking at exploring this in kind of partnership with obviously the, the justice system and public health. And again, this is not going yet, but I think there's some real interest. And I think this is real important because this is you know the, the, the need to kind of continuing using substances when someone gets out of jail often drives crime, which gets them back in. But really on a humanistic level, that's one of the highest overdose risks for a person if they've gone without for a couple of days or are kind of cleaned out. They go back to using drugs that they're used to using and they can overdose because their systems are just not adjusted. And one other thing we're looking at, and this is, uh, just have some early proposals to the library system that be hearing that there's um, people who are Experiencing homelessness with mental illness are now kind of going into the public library. It's a way to get some, I like guess, shelter and safety during the day. Oftentimes, these individuals will come in and, and have disruptive behavior from what we're hearing, maybe uh, using alcohol or drugs. And, you know, and, and that's not what the library staff are, are, are typically trained to do. So um, we, we met with one of our providers who proposed that idea of starting a, a peer navigation program. Um, and looking at two potential options to do this, where you usually have uh, a peer support specialist. Again, this is someone who's had lived experience with mental illness. They just tend to be better at doing engagement work than, than a lot of the treatment professionals are. They'd be at the, they'd be either at the library or at the crisis center, and be available if someone was in need to deploy, meet with that person, hopefully get them out of the library, but more importantly, start getting them connected to the services they need, uh, and so use that touch point as an opportunity. So we, this is going to take a little bit longer to build out, but we'd really like to be able to get this in place before the end of the year. All right, this is a lot. So um, we try to get this a little quicker. Um, you may have heard a presentation on this before. Very fortunate this community that Cape Fear Valley was able to open some child psychiatric beds. Some of the communities don't have psych, uh, child psychiatric beds, and it's a huge issue. So one of the things we want to do is provide a different uh, point in our region for children in a crisis other than going to the emergency room. And also this becomes a point for the kids in the Department of Social Service custody who are having a crisis and if they're in a behavioral health crisis, they can actually be brought to this facility. So it's going to be a 16-bed uh, facility-based crisis that's basically like an inpatient light set. So it has uh, 16 treatment beds, average time youth are there between five and seven days. But I think almost a more important component, it has a 24-7 uh, crisis and assessment um, component. So it almost operates like a, a psychiatric emergency department for kids and in urgent care. So any time of the day, family can show up with a child, have the child assessed. Hopefully they can send the child back home, lead to treatment. If the child can't be sent home immediately, the child can stay up up to 23 hours, almost have a respite and a cooling off point for the family and the youth, and then go back home. If that doesn't work, then they can access those, those crisis beds. So this is slated to open probably at this point, first of the year. We have, and you know, it's, we're experiencing this in Cumberland County. We've had these construction projects, and Alliance is not a construction firm, so we contract these things out, and we've had just a, a heck of a time getting through licensure. So licensure walks through, they find an issue, that's repaired, there's no other issues they gave at that time. They come back, look at the repair work, and say, that's great. They go walk around the building and then find something else, and we're, we're back to that. So this is pending licensure. This will be able to be available uh, to Cumberland County youth uh, somewhere around January. 
Um, it's in Cuba and Marina, so it's you know not super close, but not not too far away. All right, so you'll notice I didn't have a slide on rocks here. It was unfortunately kind of intentional, um, but I do want to say a couple words. I know that there's concern that that that's not fully open, and, and I share that. We share that concern. It's been a source of immense frustration that a new provider is taking over that facility. They've actually been operating some of the services there for now over a year, and we're still having a hard time getting over the finish line with uh, the vision of uh, health regulatory services on licensure. But they are serving people, and one of the things they do is they offer that same 24-7 walk-in and law enforcement drop-off capacity, and that happens there. Law enforcement encounters someone in the community, they suspect they might be intoxicated or suspect that they have a behavioral health issue, they can bring them over to uh, RI, or the Cumberland County Crisis Response Center, and the person can be seen, assessed, and stay there for up to 23 hours and hope to find a different disposition. So last year, uh, the full year uh, from July 21 until June 30, they served about 650 individuals uh, in crisis. And they, they do some other things too. So if an individual uh, shows up in crisis hours, they'll continue to follow them with psychiatric care, provide medication management. They also have peer support who works and follows these individuals in the community. Um, and, and, you know, so that's, that's on average almost about 100 more people a year that were being seen by, um, before when it was run under the hospital system. So part of it is just a slightly different model. And again, we, we think this will really make a bigger difference once those beds are open because there are individuals that unfortunately we still need care and they have to be brought over to Cape Fear then if they can't be, if they can't go home after 23 hours or if they can't find another crisis bed. All right, I think we're getting ready to bring this home. So there has been some questions about community involvement. And, um, Mr. Evans brought up a good point about outreach. So we do a lot in the community. So um, just over the last several months, there's been 50 uh, kind of engagement outreach efforts that the community health and well-being team have engaged in. That's a division of alliance. And so this is kind of what we're talking about. 16 were different community trainings, so specific community trainings, or groups that invite us to talk about you know, different topics from depression, uh, trauma, and, and we always use those to give a little bit of a plug about how to access behavioral health services. We participate in community food drives and then community outreach events. So if there's a, uh, something going on in a uh, high-risk community, there's a health fair or a back-to-school event, we make sure our teams are there giving out information on Alliance and how to access care. The other thing we do is also we believe that housing is a really important strategy to help people in their overall health care, their overall mental health well-being. So we're doing some more technical assistance to local stakeholders about how you prevent eviction. You know, our members struggle enough. If they become homeless, it becomes a crisis. I mean, it's a crisis for anyone, but if you're mentally ill, you have no place to store your medicine, some medications, you know, you have no, you know really no one there looking after you. People with mental illness are more likely to be uh, victims of violent crime. So it's a real host of issues that we want to prevent our population from being homeless. So we do have, um, like I said, we do have a, a staff of, there's two staff that typically work out of our Cumberland location, two kinds of staff, I should say, not two staff. There's our care managers, um, and Carlotta and Vanna represent that, where they, they really help to make sure individuals get connected with care. If someone goes to the hospital, they get alerted, they'll go make sure they're following up and, and provide that ongoing support. And then there's also a team of individuals who do this community outreach and education. They go and engage members. And we have a team of five that are located in Cumberland County. And that's, that's their job, to participate in all these kind of community events. They host some collaboratives. They bring together um, child and family teams, um, care reviews for high-risk kids and adults in the community. So they do a lot of those activities. We recently uh, hired a, um, a new uh, director of community engagement. So if someone wants to kind of talk about kind of some bigger programming or bigger concerns that might be out of the reach of our more direct staff here, um, that we've hired that person. We can leave that uh, contact information, but that person's name is Amy Ozawa. She's been with Alliance for a while, really knows communities and resources as well. Uh, let's see here. All right, so, um, so funding. So at the end of uh, this year 20, um, Alliance of the, of the $4.8 million that uh, Alliance had to spend from the county, we had a significant amount of dollars left over. And part of that was we were seeing a, a COVID impact, that people really stopped accessing a 
lot of services. We saw that in the healthcare industry as well. Unless it was emergency, anything that could be put off, people just did, you know, didn't show up for appointments. A lot of our providers started having to provide things uh, telephonically or through virtual care. So we did see a decline in services, which led us to have that fund balance. Um, and we did get permission from the county to use a million dollars to do some system building. And so I can talk a little bit about that. So here's how we spent most of that million dollars. So some of the programs I talked about today, to start up the mortgage program, to renovate the group home called Sally Hill, which would be the crisis uh, group home for children uh, within the Department of Social Services. Uh, Commissioner Adams, this is a, a care management pilot you were talking about that we're running, the V pilot. It's again to work with children with more complex needs. Again, that's through community care, community agency. Another really exciting thing we're able to do is provide bridge housing. So with the county funding, we're able to work with a local developer and get, uh, I believe it's 12, 12 or 16 uh, housing units for individuals who are coming out of state hospitals. So it can help really fund that. Uh, it, it provides a safe place for people to be who can't really just live on their own yet. So it gives roughly uh, 90, sometimes 120 days where individuals can live. And then a care team looks to find a more permanent place for that individual to live. Is that the one where, um, that's our, our, no, not our, our, uh, our, our RHD. RHD. Yeah. yeah. I believe so, yes. But, you know, um, and I'm glad you brought that because none of it's us your knew. your idea too. So, but you know, it's kind of crazy with my idea, but none of us knew that it actually had come. And I saw the houses and, and they are uh, tremendous. So people who think it might be just something that people just kind of go in, these are brand new houses that are, 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 they're very, very good. So I just wanted to make sure that's that transitional housing over there behind, um, um, behind the hospital. So if anybody gets a chance, it was, uh, it was good. Yeah. yeah. And again, this is a huge thing for us. <laughs> that, that population coming out of, you know, if people are needing state hospitalization, it's community of Cherry Hospital. It, you know, this is one of the things that allows people to get out of Cherry a little quicker and not to return to Cherry so quickly as well. Um, I'm trying to think of the other things that are here. Um, then we also did some things for medication. Big issue with the state not being Medicaid is kind of just a small pot of money to pay for treatment for people with mental illness. However, there's no money for their medication. And so we have to figure out ways to do that. So in a partnership with the county, they will provide money where we can take organizations that already work in the community to, to provide medications at free or reduced costs and give them some dollars to buy and purchase more medication. And a big thing, we're really big on trying to make sure everyone has Narcan who needs it and provide funding to the health department so they can go ahead and buy Narcan and make sure it's being distributed. Narcan is a rescue drug for people on opioids. All right, I'll turn it back to Mr. Robinson. Unless there's any more questions. Sir. All right, I'm going to wrap, wrap this up. And just a reminder. Oh, can I ask one question? Sure. Yeah. Anything with the school system? Or do we have, are we dealing with anything? Because that's always an issue that comes up. Yeah, I think the, the, the one thing we have done with the school system is the uh, day treatment program. That's a part of the um, Just one thing that um, every program that Sean talked about is a new program or one that's coming online. We still offer the same services that we've always offered here in this community. Uh, we're able to do this through our savings. Um, that's one good thing about us being the public sector. All of our money is used to reinvest back in the community. Um, and so we're, we're happy and proud to do that. The last effort, I'm not going to go through this slide. Um, as I said earlier, kids in foster care is our top priority, making sure we can um, provide needed services to that group. Again, it's a small amount of kids, but it's enough kids that I know creates havoc for social services across our region. One of our strategies to work with other LMEMs better for DSSs and for the kids. Um, and so we're standardizing some things. This talks a little bit about their work that we're doing together. And I'm going to stop there and see if there are any additional questions for myself or Sean. Any questions, comments? Thank you for the update. Appreciate it. Appreciate it. Thank you, Mrs. Family. You want to introduce uh, and what they do out at the? Uh, oh, did you do that? Yeah. I missed that. Okay. All right. <laughs> Thank you. All right. I know he's had to do it. His boss is in the room over there. That's what happens. Uh, Madam Manager, that takes us to a quick adjustment.
Um, a faster thing, Mr. Todd, on the Innovation and Technology Service Update. Yes, sir. It's also been quite a uh, time since we had Mr. Keith Todd give us an update on the projects that Innovation and Technology Services is working on. So we've asked him to prepare a comprehensive presentation, but we'll ask him to do it on speed dial. How about that? Speed dial. Yeah. Okay. Well, just so, just so I can... Uh, Kind of just not, not you, Mr. Todd, but I know that um, Commissioner Keith, Commissioner, I mean, Commissioner Booth and Commissioner Council couldn't be here today. Yes, Commissioner Keith has to leave at 3. I leave at 3.30. So just kind of give everybody an idea of how fast you got to be, or how slow you got to be. Right. <laughs> I can talk fast, <laughs> maybe. First of all, thank you for this opportunity uh, to present to you today on some technology projects we had before us. Um, I'll get right into our presentation. Um, this is our current state. <clears throat> we'll begin with current state. We have roughly 49 IT professionals and, and are located at four different locations throughout the county. <clears throat> Over the past 12 months, we've completed roughly 29 projects of various complexities, um, some of which are um, one or two weeks in nature, while others may be multi-year projects, <clears throat> which can show you some of the discrepancies in the numbers we had before us. We're currently working on 73 total projects with 132 planned projects before us already. Um, our staple system today is our service to desk. We, we roughly have 13,323 tickets in the past 12 months that's hit our desk. We've been able to close out 12,919 of those. Currently with we'll slightly over 400 of those open for some status. <clears throat> so uh, right, right away I'll just get into our first project, which is our completed projects at this point. We have recently completed our, uh, in, live actually in, in August of this year with our CureMD projects project, which is our new EHR, Electronics Health Records system. This system allows for automation, <clears throat> it allows for uh, streamlined processes, it also integrates with our current laboratory information system, which is called LIMS ABC. Um, in addition, it also integrates with LabCorp. So we're able to send, staff are able to send lab, labs and receive lab results through LabCorp, straight through from the system, get results back and forth. Streamlines the processes very, very well. Uh, our next steps in the, that pathway of implementation will be we're putting together a, a kiosk for patient portals, uh, for patient registration rather, the iPads. Patients can come in and can register with iPads throughout the facility and be assigned to their uh, specific clinic. Uh, we're also working towards a new patient portal for patients to can review their medical information online and also schedule appointments online as well. Um, electronic faxing is also a part of this new system as well as the NC quit line um, to provide support for patients to help them quit smoking. <clears throat> we also completed an ABL Fleetio project uh, recently as well. Get to my notes. Uh, Cumberland County, you know, we, we, our county cars now are equipped with ABL, automatic vehicle locators, to give insight into vehicle usage, route planning, and also improve staff safety. Uh, we have additionally tied the system into our fleet management system, which is a new system just in this past year, uh, which provides shop management, uh, order, work order management, fleet ma maintenance for vehicles, and all of our a ABLs in the cars are now have as in tele telemetry data straight to the video system, uh, which allows staff to do a preventative maintenance and get errors and check engine lights and codes and all those kind of things automatically sent to their system for response. Did it tell you how old that car is and need to be replaced? It, it, it does. It does allow tracking and all those kind of things. <laughs> Full vehicle tracking from, from getting to him. So Neighborly uh, is another project that was recently completed. Uh, it's actually a current project underway. It looks, of course, a bit um, back up. Community development is actually using the system to replace our current system or, or legacy system. It provides an all-inclusive way to automate and streamline multiple manual processes for them today. Um, it allows them to track long tracking, do HUD tracking, um, and also from construction bids to actually full-scale project management for all projects. Technologic is also a system that um, the library will be using to replace all the RFID tags in the, in the, in the, throughout the facility um, and to 
Uh, this also includes a gate, gates at the um, entry doors to allow for the ability to track people that come in or count people that come in to ensure that we have a way of understanding how utilized the libraries actually are. I did not. It's just, I'm not sure. It's just, um, somehow it skipped that, that for me. So let me go back to it. So Intergov was our, um, actually we went live on Intergov last year. Um, my sequence went out of, it, out of place here for some reason. So um, the Intergov upgrade has been completed. We set forth um, additional features and allows it internal uh, development of customized forms and projects um, and reports. Uh, the system as it was it didn't allow ITS staff to really go in and do much in the area of creating forms and reports that were necessary for the, for the planning department. Um, we have that ability now. Uh, there's also an additional um, environmental health module that's dedicated to environmental health that's also um, in the works as well, being deployed as well. Um, and the new version allows for the addition of the payment processes to be added. Uh, we've, we've been working towards that for some time now. Um, this new system, this new upgrade allows us to allow citizens now to complete and pay for their engagements online with their payments, with permits, and inspections online now. Is that just, oh, inspection is Because I, that asset is, uh, I think I talked to the manager, that uh, people tried to pay their taxes online and it came up that they couldn't. It just kicked them out of the system. We resolved that. Yes. Yeah, because I mean, I was on, on Goldie and he showed me that. So I, we can send him back an answer to it because some people had called in and said that they had tried to go online. And that, that has been resolved. I think, I think what was that they were actually going to a, to the website. They didn't type in www.cummercountingnc.gov. Um, without the www, it was now allowing them to actually complete the transaction. So that's been corrected now with the state as well. So if you would uh, at least out at WFNC with Goldie, so that he can respond to whoever sent it to him, if you just give him that correction of whatever needs to be done, that way we at least answer his questions and whoever called into him about that, because uh, he yeah. talked to me about it the last time. Because he tried to go in and it came up that way. So, all right, thank that you. That's been corrected. Great job. Okay, um, you're right, phase one. Thank you, madam. You know, we were able to develop an internal uh, system for emergency rental assistance program. It was implemented earlier this year in collaboration with DSS staff. Um, it allowed us to directly support those that apply for emergency rental assistance. Um, Did that speed up the process? <laughs> sorry? Did it speed up the process? Um, I, I can say this, that, you know, from, you know, obviously I'm a, from a technical <laughs> say yeah for that last week. <laughs> I can say this, you know, it, it, the system allows for, for that completion. Um, I know that there was over 5,000 applicants that's gone through. I think it's, I think it's down, the last dashboard I saw was down to less than 300. Uh, so it's been a dramatic, dr drastic decrease in those applications. But the system did allow them. Because previously that system was managed by IEM, mm -hmm. and we had to migrate all that data, applicant data from that system over to our system that we developed internally and, and allow our, our team to really respond to those those applicants that were there. So just go to you first, huh? Go ahead. <laughs> Wait a minute, before you go, on, let me make sure I have some clarity on this. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yes, sir. Um, you said that, it, and I, I hope I heard you right, but I forget the number. I think the number was like 5,000 applicants, 6,000. 6,000 applications that you had for people asking for funding for the rental assistance program. And and now you're down to 300? Yes. 600, 634? But either way, that's amazing. That's amazing and, and because people have been calling and asking about it. <laughs> uh, but, but, but it's still but, 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 even if, even, if it, even if everyone does not qualify, they have an answer. Exactly. They have an answer. And that, and that, that was the concern of a lot of individuals. And they wouldn't hear anything. And I'm sorry for holding you, but I want, I want to tell you that's, that's fantastic. I'll mention sobriety court real fast. Uh, this is an internal system built for sobriety court. 
uh, allow them to basically track everyone that has to attend sobriety program um, and allows them to do, to do that digitally within the courtroom at the time of spot of the uh, in the courtroom itself. So, um, is that a possibility to take it to all of those other um, uh, specialty courts? So they have the drug court, the uh, mental health court, and all of those. Is it, well, are we going to be able to kind of this one, this one specifically was written for the pretrial, okay. which is the county right. affiliate. Right. Um, and so I don't know how, how much we can go with that, but the system's there to expand okay. if necessary. So. Right. <clears throat> I mentioned Neighborly, Kate Logic. Um, I have an issue with that slide, but sorry. Um, digital transformation program, uh, digital countywide digitization. That's a project that's underway. In collaboration with our budget department today, we have a program that includes back scan and physical documents across the county. Uh, the goal is not only to, not only to back scan documents, but also to um, digitize processes moving forward so we have a digital footprint so we don't go back to the paper copies that we previously had. We're also in the process of implementing Time Clock Plus, which we've been very desirous to get there and get a new system to manage our time sheets. Uh, that's basically what the system is. We have put forth a, we're working towards a comprehensive schedule today with our team to lay out a schedule that we feel like we can meet and set a go live date towards that project's on the way. Another one you may be interested in is the Emergency Services Center. Um, we, we, this, is, this is a, um, a picture here is two of our ITS staff members, two of the eight that's pretty much daily working on this project. Um, and as you can see, uh, they're implementing the infrastructure uh, in these photos, which is a good indication that we're getting very close. When IT gets involved and we're in, inside of the building putting technology out, we are at the, at the onset of going, um, having a, an active facility. <clears throat> the facility, um, as you guys are aware, uh, that we have ribbon cut in October 26, uh, with a go live shortly to follow um, thereafter. I'd like to believe you acknowledge them by having those uh, uh, individuals that have closed on all of those projects. Yeah. That yeah. was very nice. Their day to day work, and it's a, it's, it's a very intense project. Lots of technology into a new center. Um, I appreciate it, and I know that it goes well. <clears throat> we also are working with the DSS in our modernization efforts. Um, an initiative that you set forth as far as centralization of IT functions. Uh, we are actively engaged working with DSS today uh, to move some older technologies over. We currently have 13 systems that we're working with to modernize with them. Some of these, some of these systems are case management, claims, day sheets, and others. Um, also, you'll see here that you know, due to the consolidation effort, we are in the process of moving the DSS website over to the county website. That's, that's set to be done in the next, even this week, I think. So, that's on its way. Um, and also the main conference rooms at DSS, great facility, great space. Uh, the technology is quite outdated and we're working to update the technology and also add some enhanced features such as video conferencing in those, those facilities. Yes, sir. So, uh, and I do uh, move that DSS website to the county uh, work page, which I think is great. Are all departments going to be in that same vein? Not now, I mean, but is that the... It, so, I mean, we're, you're at DSS doing that, which is great, but is that every department is going to eventually do that too? Every department except for, I think, the Sheriff's Office may be. Where and the register of deeds. Because they're, I mean, they're elected to feed. I mean, I understand that, but everybody else. Um, yes, uh, okay. I think DSS is the last one. Oh, wow. It's, it's the last one. Okay, so everybody else is done, and this is going to be this? Oh, this is exciting then. Okay. With the launch of the new website, the library. Yeah. So DSS oh. is still the platform. Okay. All right. So we working on that. Okay. Good. Um, real quickly, um, Eagle View Pitometry. Um, this, is, this is a project we're working on. It's, pitometry provides multiple views of high resolution resolution imagery. Um, Big brother watching you right here. <laughs> 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 Here, that's the traditional ortho, the traditional flyover. Pitometry gives us information from every single angle, and so now we can, we can staff can measure height of the building. They can get situational awareness. They can uh, cross reference and confirm chem sketches and tacks and all those kind of things. It also can it can it can also also notify you of any kind of structural changes 
to facilities as well. So that you can tax them more. I'm just trying to figure out. <laughs> we, get the, we get the correct information. We don't want anybody to be paying more than they should, so that's a good thing. Everybody pay, pay their fair share, that's all. <laughs> they put a new fence up there if they want to. <laughs> okay, uh, we'll take a look at some quickly on, on some projects we've um, completed. We're also going to look at some projects for us upcoming. Um, Calendly is one of those internal projects that we're working on that we anticipate really helping us in the coordination of meetings. We have tons of meetings throughout the county where key staff is trying to organize and put schedules together, and it's very challenging. It's complicated, and oftentimes meetings are missed because of that. So uh, Calendly is one of those projects that we think is going to help us streamline the meeting scheduling process for the county. One span is also um, a project into which it gives us a digital signature capability. It's a digital signature solution. Um, we have several processes a day that are limited because of the signature being required. Just to continue that effort to streamline processes that do require a dig digital signature where it is legally permissible. <clears throat> We're also in the efforts of putting together um, plans around a new county kind of mobile app. Uh, we'll soon begin the discovery phase uh, to implement a branded mobile app with a focus on citizen request management, notifications, communications, and those kind of efforts. The discovery phase is upcoming and we're planning to put together the framework around that very soon. And the last one I mentioned on this slide is Novus Agenda. Um, we, we're, we're set to um, replace our Novus Agenda management system, uh, which does impact uh, a lot of folks across the county. Um, and it's basically due to the, the the acquisition of Novus Agenda by Granicus um, and the direction of the product. Uh, because of that, we want to look for something that's give us more high configurability and to be able to manage it and support it even better. Um, a lot of the things we do today requires changes, require a lot of overhead, um, and we're trying to allow ourselves to do those changes internally uh, to speed up the process there. We're also in the process of replacing our fire RMS system. Uh, that's our record management system for fire. That system is basically, is it has limitations on our ability to interface and, and do invoices in, internally, and it's also approaching end of life. As you know, we've been migrating most of our email accounts over to at CumberlandCountyNC.gov. Um, as of, when we've completed with that project, we will be moving to Exchange Online, which gives us a lot more flexibility to allow us to connect to Outlook from anywhere. Um, to support, it's a, it's a direct support of the telework project or telework efforts. Um, we're also in the works of... Can I um, ask you a question? Though? Yes, sir. If it's like the other commission and everybody else in here, they gave out the cards with the old. So if somebody who hadn't talked to us in two years tries to email us under that old email address, will it migrate to this? Yes, sir. This? Oh. Uh, it, for a period of six months past, it's still going to allow those emails to come over and allow those communication channels to happen. Uh, so any emails sent to your old or new will still re, uh, be received. Um, CRM is a customer relationship management. Um, we're, we're currently um, sharing inform uh, citizen information across, uh, what, what it allows you to do is share citizen information across different boundaries, different departments. The health department, DSS, child support and enforcement um, are a couple of those examples. Um, it allows you to, a citizen's record, to eliminate dual entry and have access to only the information that is important to their related functions. Uh, for example, we will, we will be looking into um, this for a pilot program, a pilot prevention program, where um, DSS, um, in collaboration, are working on that, per, on that project, and we're trying to look to the feasibility of a CRM system to allow that information sharing across those separate departments. Um, and I mentioned the ERP, uh, ERAP earlier. Um, phase two is in the works. Uh, we were actually, we completed phase one to stand up a project, a product that we can uh, pay and allow those citizens, um, those applicants to be paid. Phase two is basically allowing the new applicants to be, to enter new applicants in the ne next phase. So um, over the next few weeks, we'll be standing up what we call ERAP phase two, which was basically implementing a custom portal for citizens. And just a quick plug. 
Um, tomorrow is our first ever take day for Cumberland County. Um, ITS is hosting a take day uh, with the goal to introduce county staff with current technologies and upcoming trends uh, with the overall goal of maximizing our technology investments. We invest a lot of money here at Cumberland County in technology and thanks to you for all that you do in that regard. And we want to make sure that we're leveraging and using those technologies to the best we can possibly do. So tomorrow we'll have the one hour sessions with our county staff. Uh, we'll have booths, we'll have information um, and for the purpose of really ensuring that we are leveraging those technologies to the fullest extent possible. So I'll wrap up as quickly as I could. Mm -hmm. yeah, Commissioner Keith. Staying up and staying up a lot. Is there is that a problem that we're working on? I always get emails that says it's down. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, we get we get yeah. the email that is down. It's coming back up. Most, it's down. most of it's scheduled maintenance. Okay. Okay. Um, the we're still getting a lot of spam calls. I mean, we're we get them as commissioners. I'm sure other people are getting. It brings up the, the question of. Somewhere and, and, and that. Um, I know we were all at a meeting the other night, and uh, another group that we're on the board of uh, has to pay a big number in insurance for ransomware. Um, how do we how do we protect ourselves from ransomware? That is, that is a very comprehensive question, man. And, <laughs> and, 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 and honestly, we, we put forth um, a lot of effort around our security practices. Um, we, we, we go on the back side of the infrastructure side and ensure that we do all the benchmarks necessary. Um, one of the key things for any kind of ransomware prevention is going to be held on the side of the users. You know, users of technology is going to be the source of people. That's the avenue now that people are really aim at. So it's education of our staff. We are educating um, and hold routinely uh, security require, uh, classes. Uh, onboarding includes a security session as well. Um, and we have a CISO today that's dedicated to nothing but um, information security practices. Being well, do we have a process if we find out that there's a breach? Yes, sir. We have a, um, a very structured and the responsibility for chief information and security officer, a CISO role is to not only to make sure that we're protected and, and take all those proactive measures, but also uh, to ensure that we have a, an incident response plan. And, and we have a, an incident response plan here at Cumberland County to respond to any kind of incident that was to happen. Okay. And last thing is, can, can uh, citizens, are we at a point where they can pay for almost all the services that, are, that they request? Yeah, is there an e-commerce? Um, I think for the most part, the answer to that is yes. There's a few outliers that we're working currently with Interdub and planning with today uh, to allow those bits to be paid online. That's going to streamline the process tremendously with that bit in place. Um, there's a few of those that are outliers that I'm, 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 that I'm aware of. Um, other than that, I think the majority of those services are. Um, and a goal, a goal with our payment processor and to pay it, uh, piece is that we have a mobile app, we have all these things that can help us to understand your transaction information that you have with the county in all those areas to ensure that we have one central. Everybody works off the portal. Yeah. All right. So ours, um, I have, I'm presently working, the, the city's got a portal for like permitting and all that that actually works pretty, works pretty good. Um, but you're always going to be compared to what's happening next door. I think the majority of that um, upgrade was around that uh, portal, the CSS, they call it, the, the customer self-service uh, portal. Um, and in addition to that, um, the, the payment piece is going to really you know, expedite the process for getting the inspections and other things completed. Okay, thank you. Any other questions or comments? Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. John. Very good. Excellent presentation. Uh, that will take us to, I guess, the local agreement with um, 
the city of Fayetteville, the city of Attorney. Oh, there he is. Yes, sir, Mr. Chairman, Commissioners, back in November, you adopted a project, capital project budget for the uh, uh, appropriation of the two and a half million dollars to the Martin Luther King Jr. Park Memorial Park uh, Spire project that uh, the uh, MLK committee had, had proposed. I attached a copy of that capital project budget that you adopted back then, along with this interlocal agreement with the city of Fayetteville. The city has been pushing to get this interlocal agreement in place. I really wanted to see the funding agreement between the, the committee and the state because those funding agreements all, always have some requirements that have to be met, and right now, including timing and that sort of stuff. But this this agreement is, is consistent with the project budget you adopted, with the exception that back when that was done, it was our expectation that the committee itself was doing this project that has changed. The city is, is going to undertake the construction of the project. It will be a city project in all respects. It's on city property, and it will be maintained by the city and some of the other questions you had. The, the, the issue that's, that's left sort of in the air, though, is the city is not willing to be responsible for the design of the project. And so this agreement between the county and the city provides that the committee will be responsible for complying with the uh, legal requirements to procure the services to get the design done and will pay for that out of the monies appropriated by the state first. So that, that's how we addressed it. I, had, I, I think the problem with not getting the funding agreement is just, just Mr. Uh, Lacey Wilson's very untimely death when, when this was starting about. But I, I've been told by the city folks that Ronnie Mitchell is the contact person now, and I've asked Ronnie for the agreement. And he said he would try to run it down, but I haven't heard back. I, 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 I was at their meeting the other day because I just wanted to know what was going on. And uh, I think they have the documents, or, or they can get the documents, is that Mr. Lacey passed away and they thought it was just kind of not going to his uh, uh, his wife and when she was in that to be able to get that. So I think that's just the delay they had. I saw and Ronnie, I think, I thought so and I talked right. to Ronnie, so that was that's the delay. He didn't want to be insensitive uh, at the time of the death. Does anyone have any questions about the agreement? And the city is, I think, the city's expectation is that y'all will approve this or uh, consider it Monday and, uh, and they'll take it up shortly thereafter. Anybody have any questions, comments? If not, I'll take a motion to approve um, the interlocal agreement as drafted by the attorney. Okay, I got one question. That's good. Um, yes, sir. So we're still on board. We assisted with this project. As far as the pledging is concerned from the Cumberland County Board of Commission. That's what they say, right? We will only be giving right. money to the city, and it will be on a reimbursement basis as they submit invoices for construction. Okay. So I move that we accept the report from the attorney regarding MLK. Yeah. In our local agreement. Yeah, move this forward. Uh, move it to the consent agenda. Yes. Excuse me? Move it to the consent agenda. Yes. That's what I said. Second. It's been moved and second. All those in favor? Yeah, All right, thank you. 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 Application. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> um, the community transportation program receives right now uh, approximately four grant grant funding uh, programs. Um, we are requesting, or staff is requesting, approval um, for staff to be able to submit these grant applications to NCDOT for reimbursement. The Section 5311 grant requires a public hearing in order to be eligible to uh, receive those grant funds, but the other, other three grant programs do, will not or does not require a public hearing. The, all of these funds are used to uh, 
of course, fund and operate the community transportation program for Cumberland County. And these grant funds, or the, the request today, is for grant funding that would run from July 1st of 2023 through June 30th of 2024. You can see the actual estimated um, grant allocation amounts with the estimated uh, local share matches of appropriate for each one of the grant programs. And you can see some of the local matches are 15%, some 10%, some 20, and some 50. Um, a public hearing, as I stated, is required uh, for the 5311 only. And if you pay attention to the ROPE um, funding grant amount, um, it has multiple subcomponents to it. So that 10% only applies to that, that percentage. Yeah, it's definitely not 10% of 317,000. Um, staff is asking or requesting that you uh, move this item to the October 17th Board of Commissioners meeting, and we hold the public hearing for the Section 5311 grant funding. Commissioner Key. Thank you. Um, really quick. The rope is the actual paying of the vendors and stuff to do this, right? Correct. All right. So my question is, we got $200,000 in administrative costs. I know you have some people that are doing it. But we have $400,000 in capital. And this is a service. So what do we buy in this capital? The other, the other grants, the 5310 and the 5307, are also used to pay the subcontractors. They say capital. They say capital, but it is, it is a percentage of capital. But they are also programs to provide services for our citizens as well. It is not to just pay for, um, you know, the invoices that the subconsultant. I guess he's talking about capital being a, a, a building or a fixed like asset. For the vehicles. Right. right. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah, that's, we buy vehicles? I mean, are, are we doing, we're, we're, we're we do not, no. Yeah. We provide the services. So why? Is capital not capital? I think this um, this is a state title, isn't it? Is it's correct. a state title, but it's not correctly titled. The majority of 5310 and 5307 are to pay the vendors. I thought that was what the ROAP was. But there's multiple grants that we use okay. to pay the vendors. It's okay. the ROAP, the 5310, and 5307. Okay. How much did we spend last year? Uh, I do not have that number. Any other questions? I got a comment. I, I really hope it is not, it's potato transportation, but not what you're talking about. But I really hope that at some point that this board will realize that this county is growing and that we need metro transit here in Cumberland County. I don't know what makes us think that that would not be a beneficial part of Cumberland County. So I just wanted to say that while we're talking about transportation. So if I can get a motion to approve the grants for 5310, 5307, the rope, and uh, for 5311, but to hold a public hearing on that um, at the board meeting. So moved. Is there a second? Second. Then moving to second, all those in favor? That will be Commissioner Lancaster, Commissioner Stewart, Commissioner Adams, Commissioner Evans, <laughs> opposed? Commissioner Key. Thank you. Uh, that will take us to the guidance on the variable lot residential development options. And I think this is kind of the information and then we'll be able to look at it. Absolutely. All right. Thank you. Madam Mayor. Yes, sir. I'm going to recognize Mr. Rawls Howard. Um, <clears throat> several months ago, the board considered zero lot lines. And so we're coming back just for information today for a future discussion. So guidance on variable lot residential. Thank you. Can I ask you a question first? Because yes, I don't know if everybody else got the same uh, emails that I got um, as whether um, it engaged um, the real estate uh, uh, people, the surveyors, and all those. Do they have input in all of this? This or particular item? item? Uh -huh. uh, no, ma'am. No, sir. So we're going to post this for them to get comments. But today we're just taking information. Correct. And looking at it. So it'll be posted for them to have 
uh, com a comment period. Mm -hmm. Just, right. just wanted to make sure that that was out there so folks would know that uh, they'll be able to make comments on that. Thank you. Right. So, um, <laughs> Mr. Rawls, let me clarify. Mr. Chairman, I had, had discussed this at length with, with Rawls, and it, and we, he and I both agreed that it would, this is just a, a presentation of some different options for the board to give us further direction. Of. That's all this is right now. And you may want to send this direction to the to the planning board itself to you know just what it would suit the board wants to do. Well, what I don't understand is why I didn't go to the planning board to, for them to, to, to look at these options and then bring it to us. I mean, that's what the planning board is there for. They, they hopefully have that more so and a lot more time to discuss it and see. And they can rank them. It's not necessarily we got to take that, but it seems to be it should go to the planning board first. Then you got all of that. My discussion with the, some, of the, some of the planning board members about was that they really didn't have a sense of what the board wanted to do, and they were just kind of looking but, at some but patterns. I, I don't know. I think that if you got three options, that's what staff and the planning board okay. is to be able to do and bring it to us. I, I, I may understand what the planning board, we, but is to, to give us some guidance on it so that we know, having taken all of allowing those folks, I mean, they can have at that meeting, they meet at night and got all of that, they can take one of their meetings and have it for input from all of the stakeholders, and that gives us some better indication of, and then, you know, bring it that way. I'm, I'll just throw it out that way. I don't know if the board uh, is... Uh, we, we can we can certainly do that and, and just let, let the board have this information and, and go ahead and proceed in that direction. I mean, that, that's that's what we're looking for, some right. guidance from the board. So we've gotten this, and I think everybody has it because it was emailed to us, and we can... Uh, review that, but if you take it to the planning board, have them have whatever they do, and have all the stakeholders have some input, staff have input, and then bring it back to us is a much better way to proceed. Is that, can I get a, any consensus from the board? That's right. Mark? So, if we can do that. That's, I think so, that's a... So you want me not present? Or? That's right. <laughs> <laughs> I just, you know, um, uh, and it's not that I, I thought the proposals were, I looked at them all, but I think that so that we have everything, what we said we'll do, as opposed to getting it us to send back to that, they wanted input. So we're going to let them have that input and come to us. It may go back uh, and give the planning board some other direction, but I think that's the way it should come up and then go back. Sure. So thank you. Appreciate you. Is that okay? That's everybody. It is. All right. Uh, that takes us to item four. Uh, other uh, items? Yes, sir, Mr. Chairman. I failed to um, ask the board to um, look over this resolution. Mr. I'll talk to you tomorrow. That's fine. The only thing is, that usually when we do a proclamation, it's Cumberland County Board of Commissioners do hereby recognize. Why are we single out one commission? I don't have a problem. Well, but he wouldn't, it wouldn't have the seal right, and stuff. Right, right. So I think he wants to seal, and that's why he's bringing it, because he wants to seal on it. And that should be does if it's only going to be him and not do. Are we going to just do him and then you sign it? Well, I, I mean, normally when you get to the, 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 the proclaim part is everybody's proclaiming the board of commissions. I don't know where he got to. Uh, but it's the same. Charles, I think, Chuck, and I heard what you said. It, sh it should be, unless we're going to vote on this, which is kind of different, with the, as you said, with the county seal, but... Charles's name, he, I don't have any problem with it, but let Charles sign it. But he can't sign it if it's going to be from the board um, as a proclamation with the seal. It has to be signed by the chairman. That's exactly what I'm saying. It needs to be consistent. To what be I'm consistent. just saying up here, that now therefore be it proclaimed, is usually the board of commissioners. Come on in here, Mr. Charles. We talking about you. I'm so sorry. <laughs> I 
I've been turned down before. So. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's, I didn't get it in on time or what. You know, oh, and, and I've given it myself. But I, I'll, if we're going to do it, let's, let's make it yeah. consistent and do it all. Is, uh, yeah. It, as where it says, um, now therefore be proclaimed is usually by the Cumberland County Board of Commissioners. And, and that's one commission. And, and we love them. Okay, that's why it's in front of you all now. But it says Charles Evans on it. Well, I didn't type it. <laughs> no, 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 so I'm not going to throw You told me what to do. Look, let me tell you this. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not throwing everybody under the bus. This is, this is what it is. Because normally, when, whenever I want to present a proclamation to someone, I was instructed that I had to bring it before the board to get the seal. Oh, that's right. And so instead of doing that, because I know how y'all can be, I went on and presented myself. How can we be? You know, can we? No, we don't have a problem with it. It's just, 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 <laughs> the it, that it comes from the Cumber County Board of Commissioners. The, do anybody recognize and here presented? Yes, yes. Okay. That keeps it consistent with what we do. Yes, second. All right, it's been moved and second. All those in favor? Yes. All right. Thank you all so much. All right. I know you. <laughs> <laughs> all right, Madam Manager. That, that's the other items. We got monthly reports. Anybody got a, a monthly report that they want to talk about? Is that a cold session? It's a short session. Oh, oh, no. It's very right. short. All right. Can I get a motion to go into closed session? Can I get a second? It's been moved and second that we go into closed session for attorney class. Matter pursuant to NCGS 143318113. All those in favor? All right. That's unanimous. We'll go into closed session. I get a motion to go in the uh, oh, oh, yeah, closed session. I get a motion to adjourn. So, uh, second. It's been moved to second. Um, all those in favor? We are adjourned.